Okay, so now we're recording. Welcome, everyone. Um, so, today's agenda. Um, we've got uh, some hardware updates we want to talk about. Um, we've got our usual bugs reports to go through. And anybody else have any other agenda items? Nope. Okay. So, um, well, then I'll just give you a, an update on the hardware for now. Um, so we uh, made a couple extra revisions because of the uh, sketchy availability of uh, one of the power supply parts, but Kevin got that knocked out this weekend. And so we're ready to release the first iteration to the community uh, to take a look at. Um, so um, I'm not sure exactly how to announce that, but uh, I guess, uh, Gez, uh, you're probably the right one to, to take charge of that. Uh, there's a repo in... Um, it's currently marked as private uh, for the Mark II hardware. Um, and uh, so we just need to flip that over to being a public repo so people can see it. And uh, I think that's how we want to share things. We can get you know, specific feedback on the KiCad files and the design documents and stuff like that. So I did have a question actually about the design documentation. Um, right now it's all in a Google Doc and there's just really one document so far. Um, because we're only documenting the daughter board that we're building, not the whole system. Um, uh, would it be useful to turn that into um, the the markdown format in GitHub, or is it fine to just leave a link to the Google Doc? What do you What do you think will be more most useful to people and the community? So I think that not everybody has a GitHub account necessarily, and so I think it's much easier to share a Google Doc with people than it is to, you know, ask them to get a GitHub account if they want to see the repo. It's just well, you don't a, need a, a GitHub account. account to see the repo, right? Oh, because it's public, you don't. Yeah. Yeah, it'll it'll just show up. Like uh, we can, I don't know. I I I see the benefit of doing the the markup or whatever it is. Um, just because you can see it all right there in the one place. Yeah, and then it's also revision okay. controlled in, in sync with the files as well, which is nice, I think. Yeah, hmm. but there's some redundancy, so, you know, we do all the work over here and <laughs> got a copy. Well, right I mean, if we if I move it over to the, to the GitHub repo, I'll just delete the Google Doc. Like, I'm not going to keep two copies. That's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Um, Makes sense to me. So, okay. Um, the other thing on the hardware is uh, talking about part numbers. Uh, as I was going through and writing the, some of this documentation, um, it became cumbersome to like specify whether I was talking about the Mark II or the daughter board, and, you know, various configurations or whatnot. And um, so I decided to come up with a part numbering scheme. Now, I went ahead and did this without asking any of you if we already had a scheme for numbering things, but I didn't think we did. Um, so, uh, do well, I mean, I've got a, I, I have a little bit of a scheme just in that, like, I try and, I try and separate part numbers by purchased parts, fabricated parts, PCB assembly parts, the bare PCBs themselves. Right. So I, I have those four main categories. Mm -hmm. Um, so a fabricated part would be something we build ourselves, like a, plastic or mm -hmm. whatever cast part or something PCBA part is you know the daughter board they will actually have two well three we'll have three PCBA parts because we have got this little yep. USB jumper thingy or whatever mm -hmm. and then the purchase parts is like the speakers and screws and stuff um, now outside of trying to keep those categories separate I don't really care <laughs> right that's okay my, that's my only thing that I would like to do is keep those all kind of separate. Stuff. Okay, well, why don't we have a discussion about that? Because those are different concerns than the ones I had. Uh, so we don't yeah. need to have that discussion now, but let's let's take that offline. Um, my concerns were primarily about uh, version tracking, um, uh, tracking revisions that we send outside the company when they're not, you know, they're not going to be using our version control software, right? And um, and also making sure that we can correctly identify when things were made. You know, even if we make uh, the exact same part that we made, you know, two months ago, uh, I'd like to know that it was made in 
in a different you know print run, if you will, um, so that we can track that. You know, in addition to having serial numbers and all that kind of thing, which is a whole other discussion. So anyway, so that's enough on the hardware as, side. As far as GitHub repos go, do we have? I personally am a little sensitive to how many repos we we have right now, and do we? Is there a repo that exists, like a hardware repo, or even the Mark II enclosure repo, where this stuff can go, rather than creating a whole new one, or do we need to create a new repo for this? Well, we, we already have a new repo, although it could be could be moved, I suppose. Um, I can link it here in the chat. Um, I was going to have a look at whether we can, whether it would make sense to merge it with the previous hardware, Mark II hardware repo. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because obviously they can both exist um, so that people can see the progression over time, but, you know, whether it's, whether we just, um, you know, push the old prototype to a, to a different branch and then have this master, um, and just try and keep things cleaner and stuff. Um, but I haven't, I haven't had a deep look at the at the repo yet. So, right. Okay. Yeah, I'll take a look at that uh, with Derek and Kevin and see if we can uh, keep it keep it a little cleaner. Yeah, I, I agree that I think there's a ton of repos out there. It's not just with this, but there's a uh, um, yeah. There seems to be <laughs> some cleanup work that needs to be done there at some point. Um, yeah. So, okay, so I'll take an action item there. Um, right, uh, I guess we can jump right into the bug tracking. Progress reports. All right. Everyone see my screen? Okay, uh, we'll start with the project rollover prototypes. Uh, Charlie, it looks like you're still at home. <laughs> What's, how's it going? <laughs> uh, it's going all right. Um, actually on Saturday, Derek was able to drop by some of the, uh, the prototypes for, um, or I guess the audio chambers. So actually this morning I was working on um, putting some of the threaded inserts in there. Um, I got, I'm for the most part done with the ones that he gave me, but he's still going to bring some over, some more over tomorrow morning for me to do. Um, and hopefully I can get those done tomorrow as well. So um, just trying to get those threaded inserts done. And then um, ho hopefully I can get my test results back soon. Then I can start doing more stuff in the um, shop, such as like the wiring, and the soldering. So. All right, are any of the tickets that are in progress right now, can they be moved or are we still um, in the middle of the yeah. yeah, I don't think anything can move. So we're on the 3D print and prepare. That's, that's mm -hmm. what he's working on, 3D print. Oh, prepare, okay, so no. that. that's what I'm doing. And then- About 60% done with that, I'd say, mm -hmm. based on, yeah. Um, For the seven sets of audio chambers, Derek, that would that go under the same thing is 3d print and prepare seven sets of housings is it the yeah, same thing? well it's i kind of separated the auto chamber because it, okay. it was a little bit more complicated but yeah i guess the seven sets of housings is everything but the audio chamber so yeah we i don't think we can count the audio chambers until we actually put all the the speakers in i can bring speakers over tomorrow too okay we start putting those in as well okay yeah i can do that All right. So yeah, nothing, nothing's technically moved. Uh, the other, the other thing on the the prototyping front, which doesn't really concern any of you guys uh, personally, but just as a note, um, one of the wicked guys also had a bit of a scare with COVID and is getting tested and self quarantining. So that's uh, two out of what, like five or six people in that office that have had uh, scares. So to make sure we don't get delayed again, I'm gonna try and um, increase our, our safety protocols over there. So 
Um, I'll work with the Wicked crew on that, but we're going to have to be more vid vigilant than in the past in terms of um, mask wearing, social distancing, and all that. So mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we can, if someone were to get it, uh, if that unfortunate event happens, that we, um, you know, I think in some cases, the way things have been over there, if someone have got it, it may have been could easily spread to the rest of us. So I don't want that to happen. So, um, anyway, um, I am not- on the project rollover prototypes? Um, yeah, so I'm continuing to go up at, and continue the 3D printing, but it's gonna be next week until we're really able to finish all this stuff because of the, the kind of slowdown. Okay. So. Derek, you know, we already talked about the Mark II prototype a little bit. Any other updates there? Uh, just a couple of things. Scroll down to other issues. Um, let's see. I just tagged um, Gez. I tagged you with reviewing the GitHub repo um, just to have another set of eyes on it outside of Michael and I and Kevin that you know aren't as involved with it. Um, so just take a look if you could. And then I am releasing the blocking file, the blocking assembly, which is just kind of all the components and arranged and how they will be for production, but not finished plastic. Um, we'll be releasing that in the GitHub repo as well. So people can get a look at um, how it's all gonna come together, how the, it's mostly about the daughter board but BuildNet can see how it you know, mates up with the Raspberry Pi and where the speakers are going to go and how the display is going to interface with it and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, that'll be in the, the repo as well. And that's, I think, everything else is, is in the right place. So, so is that okay? Can you review? take it? Um, yeah, guys, can you, uh, can you take I was just going to, um, if you want to help with, um, with that, it'd be good to get the Google doc link. Um, I'm happy to, you know, pull that down and, and format it all up in markdown and, um, pull that across to the other repo if, if that'd be helpful. Um, otherwise it, it might be better to wait until that's in a more final position. It sounds like there's some well, yeah. other stuff that Michael wants to do on it. Yeah, so I've only really edited the README, which is, you know, just basic stuff. Um, Kevin threw something up there, but it was really simple. It's like a title. So I've added a little bit of info in the README. Um, yeah, we I'm might just having a quick look at it. It would be good to, like, sort of point to, you know, what the different... Um, what the different what what the files are that are there? Um, like we've just kind of got some basic detail about the the device, and then a whole lot of files. Um, so yeah, I think it'll be helpful if we if we kind of give people a, a little bit of a a guide as to what's there. Like we don't have to do too much hand holding kind of thing, but that could be in the Google Doc. Yeah. Looks like Michael just shared that in a chat, so we could put that in there. Yeah, happy to do that. Cool. Sounds good then. All right. Yeah, I think that's it for for this. So we um, we I don't think we talked. How long do we want, Michael? How long do we want to leave this out there for the community to review? Um, we said a week. Week, okay. Yeah, I think once we push out a, a notification, um, we should give them a week, and um, we'll see how much traffic we get. You know, if if we're getting a lot of activity and it's being really helpful, then um, then we could potentially extend it. But I think we should. We'll start. We'll start there. Uh, should we do a quick blog post about it? Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I think so, I mean, it doesn't have to be much, but. 
you know, yeah. just targeted at the people who might care to look at that and, and review it. Yeah, I just kind of figured yeah. it'd be just a way to point to it, just like, hey, this is, this is it. Can we go ahead and make sure that blog post gets put up on the Kickstarter and Indiegogo pages so that those communities can go? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Sounds good. All right. I only left Selene continuous integration open so we could um, give a status on it. It's done. The um, the code is in test right now. Um, I want to leave it there for a couple of days and, and you know go out to the UI and check and make sure everything's doing all right before I promote it. But um, but yeah, everything is uh, has been reviewed and packaged up and is um, sitting on test now. So. Um, Gaz, I don't know if you have a device pointing to test or anything, but if there's any, um, if you do and have a minute to poke around a little bit on test, that'd be awesome. So I am going to complete this sprint so we don't have to talk about it anymore. It will be released this week after a couple of days in tests, but um, in good shape. All right, cool. Congratulations. Okay, bug fix sprint. Um, so now that I'm done with the Selene stuff, I'm moving on to some of these bugs. Um, the first thing I was looking at um, was something that kind of resulted from Josh's email from earlier about his Mark II um, stopping working. So um, I think we need to probably get the, all the Kiwi code um, merged in with what's in dev right now. Um, so, Kaz, I know you did a little work on that, but I, I want to go ahead and get all this, these branches cleaned up and um, merged into to the right uh, repos so that, you know, we're not off on this uh, one-off thing. And, you know, right now, basically, the devices that we're putting out with a Kiwi image of a pretty old version of um, of core, and you can see things, you know that, you know, I think a couple of things have already come up that are like, oh yeah, I know we know I know we fixed that since, <laughs> you know, since then, but um, you know it just isn't showing up as fixed because it's not such an old version of core. Um, so, guys, you know where you left that. Yeah, uh, I think it's in the top of the to-do list, NYC369. Okay. Um, so yeah, there's some, some comments in there around, uh, I think the, the issue from memory was around um, when we updated Tornado and changed the, uh, the GUI bus um, because it used to create new New client for reconnection or something, and um, and then we shifted to you know just reconnecting to the same um, to the same tornado server. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is it worth? Mm, I was going to ask if, if it's worth cutting a release before we do this so we can do it against 20.2.5. But if we're doing it against the dev branch, then that's basically the same thing anyway. Yeah, I mean, I can wait to do the merge until the next release if we want to do that. Um, so do you have been you thinking in a while? Uh, do we have anything in dev that's worth releasing recently? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Uh, let me, I'll, I'll take a look at this and because it's been six weeks since we, um, since we did a release. Um, uh, and there isn't as much as, uh, as there usually is. Um, but there's still a few um, interesting, well, we've had 54 commits since, for, since the last, um, which includes a few um, bug fixes and stuff. So. Okay, you want me to take this, take it over then and get past um, these issues and get this branch yeah. ready for the next one? Okay. Yeah. And I think do we I don't know if we have tickets for this, but does that does that include um, getting the skills um, that have Kiwi code in them um, up to up into the twenty oh two branch or not? Are there different tickets for that? Uh, I've just been creating I've just been merging those into the Kiwi display branches on each of those on each of the skill repos. Okay. Because they still, for for a Kiwi skill, doesn't it still require some external code, which is in a different repo somewhere? Is that right? Uh, it shouldn't. It should just require the stuff that's in core. I don't think there's anything specific you have to put in there. It's all, it's all just communicating with that display bus. I believe. All right, I'm gonna have to remind myself it's too early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I thought there was I thought there was some some thing where the screen the, the screens for the skills would define somewhere else or something. Well the, yeah, the screens are defined in the Kiwi repo right now instead of in the skill. Right. Um, but that's mostly because I know we've talked about this before and we probably need to come up with it eventually is a more generic interface to display um, so that, you know, skills can basically, you know, that kind of code can go in the skill. Um, yeah, so at the moment, if I wanted to add a, a, a new screen, like if I wanted to add a, a KV display to some random skill like MB or something, I would need to update the MB skill and also update the micro display repo. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Yeah, okay. And that was mostly due to, you know, the wanting to just to get this up and not worry about creating that interface because that would have taken some time. Um, yeah. Especially yeah. if we wanted it to, to play nicely with the other stuff, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, yeah, so I don't think it's worth us spending too much time doing that at the moment if we're still in control of everything. Okay. Is that yeah, we can leave all this, I mean, we can leave the, you know, do we want to leave the QB code in core in a branch too, or? Just for our personal use, or is that worth? Well, I think this comes back to the you know we need to we need to have that conversation and and decide which way we're moving. Because I think once we start doing that, then you know we're we're moving in a particular direction, and so that's you know I feel like we need to make a call one way or the other, and um and yeah decide where we're going. All right. So this MYC 369 was really you just trying to get the, that TV branch updated with what's in core right now, not necessarily merging that into core. Uh, yeah, my plan was just to put that, uh, just to merge that back into that, um, 
back into the Kiwi display, uh, what's it called? PGMR2 display branch. That was my plan there. All right. So just to point out um, that the longer we do this, the more, you know, as skills get updated and core gets updated, you know, there's, we're, multi we're have, putting ourselves in a place where we have multiple things to update. So, um, yeah. so just to just keep in mind for everybody that this is probably something we want to do very long term. All right. Um, so, my current plan for this week is to start tackling these QB4, Pi4 image labeled um, tasks. Um, and probably will result in another image um, once those are done. So, maybe multiple, depending on how. Um, Things like Wi-Fi is not going to be a small task, but some of those other things might be might be better, might be easier. Hey, hey, I have a I have a question about Wi-Fi that goes back to um, some really basic assumption type stuff. Um, I, I are, are you sure that there's not a Wi-Fi setup package out there somewhere that somebody's maintaining for Raspberry Pi that we don't have to build from scratch the entire, you know, Wi-Fi SSID and encryption key management system? I mean, I, I, I just, it feels like we're reinventing the wheel. Somebody surely somewhere maintains a package that allow you to set up the Wi-Fi and the Pi 4 um, intelligently. Yes, so part of this issue is that the Wi-Fi setup repo has grown and is no longer just a Wi-Fi setup repo. It basically handles lots of system level things like when you do a hey Mycroft shutdown or a restart or you know any of those would things you, that would you like me to turn myself off. Yeah. <laughs> um any of those things that basically require sudo are now. Would you like me to turn myself off? No. Okay. Um, so, yes, Joshua, I agree with you that there, there, it'd be so. I'd be surprised if there wasn't something out there that would do this. Um, but this goes back to another architecture thing where I know that like the GUI. Um, the other GUI library has the touchscreen thing where you can enter Wi-Fi setup stuff. Um, and it's also using uh, a different, from what I understand from OK, it's using some network level package that um, record that so we don't, doesn't require us to, to do some of the things we were doing with the Mark 1. Does that sound right, Chris? So Yeah, I mean, also because it's got the on-screen keyboard and everything, you can just enter the into the credentials straight on the device rather than having to set up the, the hotspot which your phone connects to and going back and forth. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess there's one question is, um, you know, what do we want this thing to do? I haven't even played with the touch screen yet, but I can't imagine putting a keyboard up and doing the same thing that the GUI is doing is that difficult. Um, mm. At the same time, we have this repo out there that that does this for us. Um, I could just try to get that repo working on this Pi 4. Um, there's another possible solution. So there's different ways we can approach that um, short term and then maybe long, maybe even a different long, short term and long term solution depending on priorities and all that good stuff too. So, um, Michael, do you have any opinions on any of that? Uh, not at present. Um, okay. If we if we need to, yeah. If you want to uh, chat with it uh, afterwards, I'd be happy to uh, okay. chat with me afterwards about this. All right. I'm still tempted to push that ticket down a bit until it becomes a bit more urgent. <laughs> um, I feel like you know there's there's other stuff like well the, you know project rollover may not even use Wi-Fi and. Um, and we can, you know, do other types of provisioning. They're not going to run around and 
manually set up Wi-Fi on all the devices or anything like that. Um, yeah, I mean, they may use Wi-Fi, but they'll be able to to show onto the device. And uh, yeah, we're gonna gonna have yeah a more enterprise style provisioning process. So my my concerns are primarily surrounded by you know doing it over and over and over again, right? Like, so we. We created a Wi-Fi setup that used the serial bus for the screen for the for the Mark One. We created a Wi-Fi setup for the Raspberry Pi version. Then we created it for the Mark II, and now we're creating it again for the Mark II. And, and it seems like you know the amount of time and effort we're spending on it. We might as well be a Wi-Fi setup company, and we can sell you know Wi-Fi setup software to people in, instead of what we're doing. And so, it just you know. And it, it really came down, you know, the same thing with the Mark II sitting on my counter, like giving up the ghost. It, it, it feels like it feels like we're stuck in a, in a forever limbo of of you know going back and redoing or doing over or doing for a new architecture everything, and we never seem to get step forward to improve the performance of the of the you know the stack for the for the um, for the member or the customer that's using it, and that's not. Um, and we're not going to solve that on this call, and I, I desperately do not want these dev syncs to go over. So um, I'm I'm happy to sit on it, but the you know the the broader fact remains. Yeah, these are all going to issues that we're going to have to figure out before we start shipping out the actual Mark IIs that you know. Derek and Kevin are working on because you know the, <laughs> we can't we can't ship it you know this ship it in the state it's in now. So I think you know depending on what the timeline is for that, that'll certainly dictate you know what kind of speed we need to work on some of these issues on. Yeah, well this this sprint I just want to you know focus our attention on the fact that what we're trying to do with this sprint in particular is fix bugs. So if there's a bug in the Wi-Fi setup that we can address, that's gonna you know, make things work better, then, you know, I think that's fair game. If we're talking about re-implementing a system in a better way that's going to be, you know, better for us going forward, that's great, but it's not part of this sprint. All right. Then, yeah, we should probably move that Wi-Fi setup thing down for now. All right, um, Gez, um, any progress on any of these other tickets um yeah i've been doing a bit of a uh, bit of work um just trying to uh fix up the, the tests that are sporadically failing on on voice comp um uh and so some of them so the last one was was that some of the alarm skill queries um were getting caught by the timer skill um and can't replicate it on a local device unless you deactivate the alarm skill. Um, and so they're queries that shouldn't go to the time skill anyway, so I've sort of fixed that up. Um, and hopefully that improves things. Um, the temperature one, I shifted, it was actually a, one of the old integration tests that was failing, like from the old system. So I shifted that across the void comp and marked it as a fail because it wasn't, it's not a priority. Um, Pace and you know, there's a bunch of other stuff in there that's marked as X fail that I'd certainly jump on before we um before we go there. So that's all I did there. Um, and then the news and singing skills, this NYC three eight three, that is a uh, it's proving to be a difficult one. So Okay's also been looking at it and um, both just you know, been trying to add lots of debugging uh, in there to, to try and figure out why, what's going on. Basically, it's just the stop command uh, uh, timing out and not stopping the, not stopping the playback, but only in the bleak comp test. So like I've never been able to replicate it outside of our CI process, um, which makes it even harder to pin down. So, yeah, I am, uh, I am potentially just going to leave it, and you know, if, if we can, if we can 
get the other tests passing more consistently, then at least there will be much less failures. Um, but I'm a little stuck there at the moment. So are those last three on the in review, are those are those PRs you need me to look at right now? Uh, no, so the PRs are just are all in review. Um, oh, that's probably what you said. Yes. Yeah. yeah um, so and then the yeah, they're all they're all PRs. Okay, I can look at those after this meeting. Um, cool. Uh, but yeah, once I finish those, um, if you aren't doing it, I'll jump on the volume at max on first boot. Um, uh, so about, about volume at max on first boot, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, OK at least told me once that that was intentional, um, mostly because I think worried about maybe a hearing impaired person or something like that. Um, that yeah, would... that's not on the PV. Not, well, not on the, the latest stuff. Okay. Yeah, no, um, we did, David did the work on that, as far as I remember, Wagner did the work on that. So, I okay, might not recall that. But yeah, we, um, it's it's too loud. <laughs> it'll, so blow the should... it'll blow the speakers off. It's because the amp is, will overdrive those. Well, okay. let's see. No, I don't actually. I don't. If we have the the I two C set for the max volume correct, it shouldn't have blown speakers. But it is still too loud. So as long as if we pull over all that I two C set stuff that we did on the the, the the thing before, back in you know November December last year or whatever, I believe it was around seventy percent volume when it first booted. Okay. Yeah. So I need to. Do you think that stuff's probably in the Mark II enclosure repo? I can find it there, maybe. I mean, there should be something that boot up that's doing some I two C commands, like setting some I two C stuff. All right. I'll see if I can find it. Yeah, and we want to do that on the enclosure side of things, right? Because it's going to be yeah. different for different hardware. Yeah. That was yeah. on that level. So. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and I did put a note in there, like the. We're still playing around with what voltages we're going to use, um, but the way we spec it right now is a 12 volt supply. And given the speakers that we spec, you know, our, the speakers can't take the 13 watts that our amplifier can supply, so the speakers will blow out. Um, so we might yeah. have to switch down to like an eight or nine volt supply, um, but we're going to play around with that and see what kind of sound quality we get. Yeah, we'll yeah. need to know like you know what the max. Like I know with with the old with the previous versions, max I two C volume was higher than what we wanted actually the max volume for the device to be. So I know there's some playing around there too as to what we want. Um, you know, volume yeah. ten, how loud that needs to be. I, I mean, I, my my preference is to make sure that the max volume on the I two C is the max volume that the device can create. Right. Uh, that way, there's no way of accidentally destroying the hardware. Um, but uh, but just you know to be aware for now we need we do need to find that and be able to control that. Okay. Yeah, we don't want them turning it up to eleven. Dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> um, another piece I was looking at the installer um, skill for that for that stuff we discussed last week, and um, uh, I think okay sent you a um, a message too about the two. Um, hidden fields, um, mm -hmm. and I did not uh, realize that that was how um, that was how Microx was previously installing things from the marketplace. Um, uh, so anyway, okay, and I was just chatting a little bit about what that process might look like in the future, um, but I think that's something that we need to talk about um, at some point from an architectural perspective. Yeah, um, would it be a good idea to remove those fields from the settings since that's not working anyway, and then add them back when we fix the install problem? That way they're not show had these just strange fields showing up in settings, nobody knows what they right. are. Yeah, we could, we could remove them to now, yeah. Okay. But I also, uh, yeah, I mean, one of my questions is whether that's uh, the best way of doing those skill installations, but I yeah, don't know I think, yeah, 
I agree. We should probably revisit that when we start talking about marketplace installs again. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, but that's another kind of reason to get rid of it because we may implement it differently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sweet. All right, I'll pull those out and um, uh, do a VR that too. All right. Anything else bug fix related, Chris, while we got you on mic? Uh, I don't think so. I've just got to then have a look at where I'm where I'm heading next after these. Well, actually, the reporting device is ready. I still haven't gotten to the core of that, so that might take a minute. I think that's more a Pycroft issue than it is a Mark II issue, right? Because there's enough stuff going on with. I think. Well, we've, we've I feel like it's across the board. I, I feel like it's a. There's. I've had it on all sorts of devices where you pair and the, the device isn't actually ready. And so I think regardless of which device you're on, I feel like if we if we handle that at the, at the Minecraft core level, then it shouldn't be possible on a device. Yeah, you know I think I mean? the, yeah, I think the way we, we handled it with the Mark II Kiwi at least is you have the loading skills progress bar, which implies you shouldn't be actually interacting with it until the skills are loaded. Um, yeah. I think by the time you get to the actual splash screen, everything is loaded and that's how we solved it for the Mark II Kiwi at least. But I think, yeah, with the Pycroft, for example, you know, it doesn't start loading skills until you get through setup and that could take 30 seconds. Yeah. And there's really no indicator that that's the case. Yeah, so we wanna make sure that, you know, um, there is a, uh, you know, my, uh, device ready or Minecraft core, Minecraft is ready message on the message bus and that it's only sent once everything is actually set up and, and ready to roll. And I think that's the case. I think that message exists. I just think that Pycroft, for example, or in other devices are, look up here to be in a ready state before that message bus message gets sent out. Yeah. So, we need to figure out a way like in, in on those devices to say, okay, or, you know, something visual or, or, or audio that says, you know, I'm not ready yet. <laughs> you, you may have paired me, but you can't use me yet. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. That, that, that message that it says it's ready shouldn't go out if it's not actually ready, you know? I'm not sure so, that it is. I think that, you know, in the, in the instance of a, like a Pycroft, I think you just, by the time you finish setup or pairing and pairing and the pairing skill says you can ask me things like this, then um, then it's still loading skills at that point, right? So, and it, it, it's sending out the, the bus message, but there's nothing in Pycroft that acts on that bus message that says, hey, yeah, we're ready to go now. Unless you're in the CLI, when you can see it. Okay. Well, in that case, then I'll, anyway, this is probably too much detail for right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I might. I'm just saying, I think, I think the issue is, is that, the, that the bus message is, is coming going out at the wrong time. I just think it's not being handled correctly by different enclosures. That's, I think, okay. is the, the problem. So. All right. I'll have a look at that. All right. All right, Ken, precise. These three tickets that are somehow encompassing everything that you're doing. <laughs> Actually, yeah. So um, <clears throat> when we last spoke on Thursday, I had a uh, big build going off, probably about 50, 60,000 files total out of the 114,000 that were classified. And I reported that it was taking upwards of, at the time, four hours. Uh, it ended up taking six hours. And then... I have been on the Lambda 2 server today, getting uh, learning the lay of the land and getting everything set up and understanding what things are. And I just completed right before this meeting for you, Josh, the same model being built on that Lambda 2 server and verified that the GPUs are active and the build time went from, and remember, my MacBook Pro is pretty good. My MacBook Pro is a 16 gig of RAM, so it's not like a little four gig 
laptop. Uh, and it's an Intel processor. So it took six hours on my laptop. It took just under an hour on the Lambda. So I guess the good news is you're getting your bang for your buck because if I have to wait six hours to turn around these models, it's going to be torturous. An hour is doable. Uh, the model that completed Monday, I haven't had a chance to test the one that just finished right before the meeting. But the one that completed Thursday night, around 11 at night, um, against the original Haymycroft, I ran it against three test data sets. I'll be doing some more work with the data pipeline and the data sets tonight and tomorrow, get a little better handle on it, but just some rough numbers. So um, this is against a test data set called test model. It was from a different model. The original Haymycroft uh, had an 88% recognition rate against that test set. The new model had a 96%. The male contributors uh, test data set, uh, original Haymycroft, 87% balanced. The new one, uh, 94%. On the female contributors test data set, Haymycroft, the original Haymycroft, 84%. The new one that was completed Thursday night, 95%. So if those numbers can be, can be trusted, and I'm going to be verifying that soon. Uh, so it looks like balancing the data may actually improve, but I'm not sure that that's just it. I also run the Epic at about 6,000, which is one of the reasons it takes so long. And I think Matt was saying he only ran 600, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to be doing some testing with different values for Epics and sensitivity levels and chunk sizes and stuff, but at least I now have a screamer that I can um, build my models against so it doesn't take quite so long. So that's good. I, I'm not putting anything on there, Josh. Um, you only have two ports open. You have 22 and 1776, and I'm assuming you'd like to keep it locked down, so I'm not going to put anything there that exposes it. The first question I have, though, is what is on that server? This is Lambda 2. Lambda 1 is Mimic. Lambda 2 has almost a terabyte of storage of which 90% is consumed. Almost, it's almost certainly wakeward samples. Well, we don't have that many. We've got about a gigabyte. Oh, you're saying you're we have un unclassified raw data somewhere. Ah, OK. Yeah, I, bet, like, we're, I bet we're from people who opted in and only people who opted in. I suspect that we're continuing to collect all that data. So, okay. I mean, so we start with excellent work. And my next question to you is, can we? Uh, so we're searching a multi-dimensional multi solution space. So we have a number of different factors that play into the, 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 the uh, accuracy of the model, including yeah. the steps and so on and so forth. Can yeah. we search that solution space in an automated fashion rather than going through and, uh, you know, hand jamming it? Uh, yeah, yeah, you know. yeah, that's where I was heading. Yeah, you're exactly right. So exactly. Uh, I don't know what that means yet um, from a, uh, you know, nuts and bolts perspective, but I understand the concept, which is if you want to test it with Epic 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, you have to sit there and do it manually, uh, figure out a way to back it off and look at what it, whether it got better or not or whatever. So yeah, um, I'm heading there. Uh, what I will do though, uh, before I get there is, I'll try to uh, put a little more consistency in some of these test data sets so that things are reproducible, verify I don't have a lot of cross-contamination. Obviously with the, um, Hey, which is why I was so surprised that the performance uh, numbers showed what they did. The Hey Mycroft model, by definition, is cross-contaminated because all of its all of the data that I have that's been tagged went into building that model. Um, none of it was taken out of it for a test set. That only happened in the the one I balanced. So if anything, Hey Mycroft should be kicking its ass, and it's not. So I don't know what's going on there. I'm going to have to look at it. But yeah, I'm working towards being able to automate that process to make it a little bit um, less cumbersome and less manual and less time consuming. Um, so what we're, what we're talking about um, is often referred to as hyperparameter optimization. Uh, I saw I saw your email. I didn't mean to ignore you. Uh, <laughs> the, the problem was that, that that class started today and while I'd love to take a class, 
I just don't believe I have the Bama for right now. I'm kind of making some progress, and I'd like to get this out of the way. Oh. So I'm going to hold off on that until the next one. But, um, yeah, I mean, it looked really cool, and I wouldn't mind attending. Oh, um, the other thing about those, uh, you can just use them as, like, reference. Like, you don't have to attend the class or anything like that. You can just, you know, you can go through at your own pace. I've done it before. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I hadn't gotten into it too much, so... Um, I was going to, you know, look at that a little more, too, because I think what that's talking about, though, are the, not the parameters that are exposed externally to us. I think it's talking about the parameters from the PB params file, which is kind of like internal parameters that the model uses to, uh, to you know, wait. Uh, so I, I don't know. I haven't gotten into it yet, okay. but I'll, we'll definitely take a look at that. But anyway, so, so the bottom line is I'm now up on the Lambda server. I'm not going to expose that Lambda server, Josh. I'll keep it locked down. Um, the only exposure will be to get data into it that's classified uh, because as we have raw data coming in, we want to get it classified and into data sets in a consistent manner so that we have versioning on them and we know we're comparing apples to apples. So I'm still grappling with that. And, the blog post code is in a little bit of a mess, but today was a good day, uh, and I anticipate some good progress in this week. Find right. where uh, I'm at. Just, just one more note on the um, on that parameter optimization. One of the parameters yeah. is how many samples you need to make it work well, ah. and, and so that's that's something worth looking into. Yes, yes, I will. Because um, from what you read, did, did, it, did it give you any? Um, I, I didn't actually in that particular course. I didn't. I didn't look at that one. I did a, another one that was a little more general. But um, yeah, the, the net result is that looking, getting more data is not always the way to improve your model. I'm glad to hear that because I was. Um, I'm kind of constrained anyway because I don't really have a lot more data. But what I do have is the ability to filter the data into clean and dirty, if you will, and then further classify it into. Uh, high and low pitch voices and things like that. And I'm suspecting that a lot of the data that I discarded, which is almost half of it, was because the classifier couldn't classify it as either a male or female voice, which could very well be because it's neither. It's just noise. And it's not clear to me that using noise during training is a great idea. So I'm not sure yet. So that's part of what I'm experimenting on. And I will definitely look into some of these classes to answer some of these questions. But I'm always, and, and that's great, you know, input, but I'm always, like, from Missouri, right? I want to see it. Like, if it says less data but more clean or cleaner is better, I want to prove it, you know? So so that's kind of where I'm at is now I have the ability to crank out some of these larger models in a reasonable amount of time. So hopefully I'll be able to do some more building of some new models this week. Uh, and I'll see, you know, firsthand whether more data or less data is better or worse. And the, the hyperparameter that is going to save you the most time is the... Uh is the number of epochs so yeah the SP right now i'm running six thousand. i don't i get the feeling that only ran it around 600 we, we had a brief discussion yeah, I, on I, that. Was, I was running substantially fewer epochs so if we can if we can identify how many epochs we need to run and crank that down to from 6,000 to 600, it means your models will take six minutes from the Lambda to compile. And once you got them down to six minutes, you can start searching that hyperparameter space. I mean, you could you could build nested nested uh, if for loops and just build a, a big, big multidimensional matrix and test them all. I mean, if it's only going to take six minutes. I mean, there are probably more elegant ways. And I would also argue that we should maybe start looking at some of the hyperparameters by inspection instead of saying, you know, here's a range. We have no idea why it's that range. We're just going to search the whole range just because. It'd be great to know what that hyperparameter does, and you know, think think it through a little bit more before randomly searching parameters. But I'm sure you're familiar with that. There, there's a couple of them I'm familiar with for the uh, for the male frames and stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I certainly don't have a handle on all of them. What I would say though is I was surprised that with half as much data. The model I built outperformed the production model. And if it's the case, and I don't know, and this is some of the stuff I'll be experimenting with and documenting, if it's the case that the difference is 600 versus 6,000 epic, then, you know, that, that's well, kind of where you you're be able to, on that. Right? You should be able to verify that, verify that pretty quickly. But I suspect that it's because you're running a, quote, unfair test in that 
um, you have a in your test data set you've got a balanced number of male and female voices but the original training you know, the originally trained model is not good at female voices your new model is and that's the, that's all the difference yeah I mean again I don't know as far as the epic goes um, I'm not I don't know what it is exactly that gave me that performance and so I guess this week part of this week will be answering that question but proving it with numbers that I can publish and everybody can look at and keep me honest now that, yeah that's what I'm at. Yeah, you can just half the number of epics in a for loop and you know inside of a an hour, you'll have the answer. Okay. Um, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I can certainly have the epics uh, and and see what the performance numbers will be given the same data, apples to apples, sure, uh, training data, whatever. Again, it's not clear to me what's the gating factor. Is it the cleanliness of the data? Is it the epics? Is it right? Well, just, that it's just take every best. parameter one at a time and yeah. just isolate it and just yeah, yes, see what yes, kind of curve you get. Right. Yep. That's that's where I'm heading tomorrow morning. So okay. Can I, can I say that I don't I don't fully trust the test results at the moment. In that, like, if we're getting eighty percent response, eighty percent success rate on female activations, then that that's significantly different from experiences on the ground. No, the guess the reason for that is that we are not we we probably are collecting, but we are not using the missed utterances so the when when nate went through and said i don't want to hear the 10 seconds before the wake word activation because you know i don't want to hear josh and chris fighting in their kitchen which is what what caused that that change we basically gave up all of the data for inadvertent activations so if, I, if you try to to activate it three times and it it fails all three times and then you activate it successfully the only one that we're capturing and classifying is a successful activation so even though in that case the accuracy rate's 25 percent the the data set that we get would be 100 percent because the only one we got was the one where it actually activated we need to go back to the way i originally wrote that software in an afternoon and uh grab the wake word attempt before the wake word. So right now the models are very heavily biased towards not activating accurately when uh, we're heavily biased towards missing the wake word as opposed to being heavily biased towards accidentally waking up. We need to go back and get those samples and use them for both classifying and testing. Josh, is there more data available that I'm not aware of than that one gigabyte of Sound, sounds like you've got a, sounds like you've got a terabyte of data sitting on that Lambda server. Yeah. <laughs> you want me to go poke it around and figure out where it is? <laughs> I think I know. It's probably, it's given that the guys probably didn't take the time to do it right, my guess is it's all in one folder. So um, when you try to cat out the context of a folder and it locks your machine up, that's probably the one it's in. So now you're going to have to use Find or something similar to go through and reclass that stuff. I mean, the... There's a variety of ways that we could have handled that problem. Um, I'm a little frustrated by this, but not so much because it's not working, because of the amount of time and money we spent with a developer to do this. And we're finding like just the really, truly basic stuff like, hey, hash the wake word file, take the hash and build a file structure so that you use the each individual letter of that hash to create a subfolder so that you know you can find these things without destroying the kernel without destroying the file management software stuff like that just didn't get it, it's okay josh i have a handle on that um i you see what's that called. Spent like a quarter of a million dollars ken well i i can't speak to that uh, all i can say is i've got index files for all of the data that i'm indexing that are in csv format now and classified so you don't need to be copying stuff around and getting locked up on individual subdirectories what i would say is there's a lot of data directories there's a at the file root system there's a dot data heaven knows what's in there there's an ml data and a bunch of stuff so i'll figure it out but the but what you're referring to is when somebody opts in which i believe there's a bug by the way because i think it sends it whether you're opt-in or not um it goes somewhere uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait, wait. Stop wait, right stop. there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that needs to be why fixed was it, right now. Why was that the, the first thing that came up in this conversation? 
That is that is the that is the absolute top priority for the entire company until the bug is solved. There is no other priority. Move it to the top of your 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 sprint. Nothing at the company gets done until that bug is fixed. And all of the data that we've collected that we should not have collected has been de deleted. That's the only well, can thing. We, can we first verify whether that is actually accurate? All I was asking is That's where true. is the data that we are collecting and shipping to the cloud ending up? That's a good question. You should answer that question. <laughs> okay, I'll figure it out. Okay, no, I, that, well, I'm not, I, what, that's not a joke. Like the, the only thing that Mycroft AI as a company is doing as of that statement right now is tracking down whether or not it's true. If it is true, tracking down the data and deleting anything that we were not authorized to collect. Every piece of data that we were unauthorized to collect needs to be gone permanently. And that's the only thing Mycroft does until that's done. Chris uh, or Gez, do either of you guys have any idea where that data ends up landing? Okay, I'll figure it out. <laughs> that's company-wide. No, so no, yeah, no, no. Guys. I mean, that's a uh, Josh is right. It's a race. Chris, Gez, Ken, who can find it first? Yeah. So <laughs> let's, let's go track that stuff down, and we can reconvene this meeting in a couple of days. Everything else, it sounds like you're doing fine, Ken. But, but uh, yeah, that's the only thing the company does. Chris, is what is the basis of your thought that we're collecting for everybody instead of just opt in? Why, why do you think that? Because I could have swore I saw when I installed my version from Dev that the the default setting for that flag is false yet i saw activity that seemed to indicate in a log file that it was sending data to the cloud okay and I'll, I have think, to, I'll have to chase it down i think that end spot that you're talking about is where that one terabyte of data is i mean there's no well, process that i know of to move anything from a cloud server to the to that lambda machine i think it just goes straight there i don't know how because only port 1776 is open on it but i can i can pour through the code line and configures configuration. Well, the, way, the way i originally built that software i created a an account that that had permissions limited both from the account perspective and then also through ssh in a way that when it it, it, the only thing it could do is shove a file up to the folder and then it would open an SSH connection and tunnel that data through one of those two ports that you just mentioned uh, and dump it onto the machine and then close the session. And that was the end of it. So um, by default, you know, rather than standing up a web server with SSL and putting in write permissions and everything else, you know, I developed it so that it would use SSH for that. Now that was, I literally developed all that software in an afternoon. So the, you know, that that was my original development in Palo Alto two years ago, you know, having had several people work on this full time since then, I would expect them to have done something a little bit more elegant, but it could be that that's still the way it's set up. I can tell you with almost 100% certainty that there's nothing about precise on any of our cloud servers. I, I, I almost live in those things and I, I don't know of anything that would, yeah, I, I don't think it's on, it's in DigitalOcean anywhere. And the, uh, lambda, the Lambda server would be the, de was the original destination. So that, that, that has not probably changed. probably still is. Okay, and when you say you tunnel it, Josh, you mean through SCP? Yeah, just a, just a, S, SCP over, you know, SCP is just a file implementation of SSH. Yeah, just a, a SCP up to the up to the folder, dump it in, and that's that. So as I recall, that user didn't even have permissions to, to retrieve the contents of like the listing of the folder. All it is is a, a destination. It can, the only thing it can do is write. Is this code within Precise or is it within Core that, that does the copying? I don't know. When I wrote it, it was probably a, a it was probably a, um, uh, I probably in, it used the the per, uh, sorry English. It's written in Python. Um, I probably used Python to make a system call to SSH and dump the file that way. Yeah, I, I doubt it's in precise. Okay. Don't, don't we like don't, don't the Wakeman samples get uploaded to Selene? Is what I assumed. No. You know, Selini reads, reads, and actually there's nothing in Selini.precise either because 
um, or at least what Tartarus used to do was read from this dumping ground of, um, of files and um, and then clap, you know, classify them and hopefully put them somewhere else. Um, so, I mean, it was really just reading and writing from wherever, um, wherever those things are living. So I think, I mean, the first thing I want, I think we should do is, you know, verify that this is an issue. Make sure that we're not, you know, we don't want to we'll do, we'll go on a wild chase, I guess is, <laughs> is my point. And then if, uh, let me just uh, follow, let me just finish up with one question on this data, by the way. The, the data that Gez gave me, the one gigabyte um, of tagged data, I'm assuming that's all the tagged data we have. Uh, but my my real question isn't so much that, it's that is that data available to be offered to our community for download or not? In other words, if I wanted to make that data set available, I've cleaned it up, I've written code to clean it up and fix some of the file names and stuff. There was like 7,000 bad file names, but that's not what I'm, what I'm getting at. Um, eventually, is it the case that we could st uh, stand that data up somewhere and say, here, Mr. Custom, if you want to build your own model, here's a great set of data to get started with. Are we allowed to do that, or is that data confidential, or we can't share it? I, I just, I, I don't know. Which data, uh, which data set, Ken, the, the wakeboard stuff? Yeah, the one, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Gez gave me a uh, about a gigabyte worth of uh, data that have been tagged as either wake word or not wake word. And I'm wondering if we can share that with the community at some point in the future yeah, or not. We can, they just need to sign the data sharing agreement, which requires them to update the, the contents of that every 30 days. So the, the thinking there, each piece of that data is connected back to an individual user. Um, if that user uh, uh, decides to opt out of sharing their data tomorrow, right? Uh, yeah. the next time we compile that data set, we'll have nuked all that stuff out. And so, you know, the the thinking there is if you if you build a model today and you incorporate that user's data and that user opts out tomorrow, which is fine, you can continue to ship the model that that was built on because it, it's really abstracted it away. There's no way of, of using that model to figure out what that user's data was. But you are required under our data sharing agreement after 30 days to update the data you're using to train the model. And that means that if in the intervening 30 days, some user has opted out, the next time you download that data, it will be gone. So it gives our now, users the right why to- might, Why might you do that? Do you have a master manifest somewhere that says this file came from this user that I'm not aware of? Um, and usually it's in the there's a user ID of some sort of a file name. Right? That's the way it is for the- yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a file name or something should have the, when I originally did it, I wrote that user's file, you know, I, the reason the file names are these long string of semi-random numbers with dashes is each dash represents a database field. So rather than trying to, to deal with the complexity of I've got a database here and a file here and I'm trying to keep them synced up, I just shoved all of the relevant information into the file name so that, you know, any one of those files, you should be able to look at it and say, this is the date and time it was updated. Here's the user it came from. This is what it contains, so on. And so just from the file name. Um, well, do you, have, do you have some sort of um, secret coding chart that would show me how to derive that information from the file names? Uh, it, I'm so frustrated by this. Uh, I, no, I don't have, it, that was the dev team, the guys that were working on this as their full-time job for years. Like, I'm so frustrated by that. Give me a file name, Ken, example name, and I'll see if I can help you with that. Yeah, let me, let me get with you in the morning, Chris, and we'll uh, interrogate one of these file names and see if we can figure out if one of these fields is a user ID or a session ID or whatever, okay? Yeah. Yeah, all right, I'll get with you. So, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll try to figure out where this data is going and, and how much are we accumulating each day, but uh, I have no idea how long this process has been going on, but 90% of that disk is consumed. 
So uh, once I understand the system better, we either upgrade that disk or we start paring back some of that data because 90% uh, is getting dangerously close to uh, where you don't want to be on a, on a data set usage. Yeah, I think well, rather than paring back, it might be a good idea to just create an archive of the stuff we already have. If this assumes that's where all the data is being pumped to still, um, I think it makes more sense to archive what we have and just free up space there. For people. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, took a, I took a measurement today. I got on first today. I know where it was at when I started, and I know where it was at when I was done. And I'll look tomorrow and the day after and see what its uh, growth rate looks like. But, yeah. Uh, and the other thing is moving some of that data off I don't know. <laughs> Not gonna be a trivial issue because you're talking about you know almost a terabyte worth of data. I don't know where you're gonna stick it and how you're gonna get it off of there. Which is there's by, a twenty by terabyte it. NAS that all that data is probably sitting on right now that's attached to the lambda. So I'm pretty sure it would be easy to move it from one place on that NAS to another. Yeah, yeah. And okay. it's, it's almost certainly sitting on on disk on the machine itself, because I'm pretty sure the lambdas don't use the NAS, but Oh really? It, yeah, it's on a it's on a 10 gig full duplex core, so it's not like moving it's going to be a huge deal. And worst case, I can send one of the wicked guys or send uh, Derek over there with a external drive, plug it in, and just suck it out through a USB 3 port. Um, but yeah, right, right. Well, let me let me let me get some knowledge so I can speak more intelligently to the situation. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay. The big rock is if we are collecting data from anybody who hasn't opted in, we need to identify where that data is and ideally without accessing it ever, nuke it. Yeah, all right. And then we need to disclose immediately to the community what happened, why, how we fixed it. Like it needs to be, we need to be a, a thousand percent transparent. All right, once, once we know, uh, then we can uh, proceed. Okay, yeah. so that's, that's my update. Sorry, it took so long. Uh, can I be notified once we know and we have a public statement? Gaz, can you make sure to loop me in on that? Uh, yeah, we will definitely be talking. Yeah. Hi, Chris. People like it. Sorry, people really like it when we admit our failures and talk about how we fix them. I don't know why they like it, but they we get a lot of praise for that. Because it's unusual. Well, yeah, <laughs> but we're, people don't usually do that. So, um, you know, I just did a dumb cursory search through the... Uh, the code base, and I don't see any obvious errors related to opt-in. Uh, so if there's something, it might be in, you know, if there is anything, uh, then it's got to be something either obscure or in like the interface between Selini and Core. So. All right, I'll uh, take a look. I'll look in Selini while you're looking, Ken, at the files on the server. I'll look and see what, if there's an endpoint in Selenium that does the, this work we're, we're talking about, too. Okay. All right. Good times. Ah, so did we, um, have we finished up going through the all the sprints as they? Uh, just to one, this Mycroft Sprint 12. Um, this I'm leaving open until I go to production and create those new um, graphics in, in Grafana. So that's why this is still open. Um, and um, probably, I'm guessing tomorrow night, um, I need to do this WordPress drop with thing now that I'm done with all the Cellini stuff I was doing. I'm trying to get to some of these things I've been putting off for a little while. So, um, Did I hear Droplet? I'm sorry, what? Did I hear Droplet? Yeah. Is it difficult to... Uh... To get me a small droplet that I can uh, put Apache on for now? Um, we use Nginx for our reverse proxies, if that's what you're using it for. Not a reverse proxy. I just want to be able to serve some CGI out of it so I can put that web page that I was running on my laptop up there so everybody internal can run their own tests if they want against our data and our models. Kind of to keep me honest. It's not imperative. It's just you can have it. You can have a droplet if you want. I'm I'm always reluctant to rent other people's computers, given that we spent a bunch of money on our own computers. Would you like your own virtual machine with a, 
you know, back to as much processor time as you want, as much storage as you want. Just send me what you want on your machine and I'll stand it up for you and give you shell access. That will be perfect. Thank you, Josh. All right, now we're done. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, well, thanks everybody. Sounds like we had a fun little scare there at the end. Um, let's uh, make sure we take care of that first thing. Um, and um, we don't have a general meeting tomorrow, but I'd like to see, um, I'd like to hear at least via email what, um, what your results are, what your findings are on that. Um, hopefully, yeah, it's just Ken with a bug open for file. that. For what? I thought we had a bug open for that. For what? Don't collect data if somebody hasn't opted in. You thought we had a no, what? If anyone, if anyone had mentioned that, that would be. a bug in one of these sprints that or on the Jira board I was looking at. All right, well, you know, before I go and, and cause all sorts of chaos with uh, off the cuff statements, let me go back and verify and make sure. So let me dig it up, figure out where it is happening and see if it is indeed happening and report back, yeah, it's, okay? Yeah, it's fine. We just, we just need to move it to the top of the priority list because it's the, it's, you know, we've publicly stated and I stand by the statement that if we do spot, well, number one, we will end up inadvertently collecting data that we don't mean to, we, we will. Like we've been very transparent, it's gonna happen from time to time because these systems are complicated. And you know, even Twitter got busted keeping all of their users' passwords, clear text in a log file, right? Like, you know, given the amount of money they spend on IT, you know, it should be should not be surprising that from time to time we're going to have a hiccup where we're inadvertently keeping something. But we have made the commitment that when that happens, we will be, it, you know, it will only last as long as we're unaware of it. So now that we know it might be a problem, it becomes our top priority, and that once we've resolved it, we'll be transparent about what happened and how we're going to fix it. So I don't. It doesn't. Security problems don't bother me, and data collection problems don't bother me because they're going to happen. It's a hundred percent certainty. There's nothing you can do to prevent them. What the issue is, you know, once they've occurred, making sure that they have become the top priority of the organization and that we're transparent about about resolving them. And that gives people the confidence that, you know, they can trust us with their data and their privacy. Did I understand? I, I don't mean to keep the dragging this meeting out, but uh, when I learn something that's actionable, it's interesting. Did I understand you correctly? The automated process, which is gathering the data that's being sent to the cloud, is determining whether or not a wake word was spoken or not and sending it up there based upon its interpretation of whether it thinks the energy was actually a wake word or not? How is that data getting classified? There, there used to be this great online suite where everybody could go in and classify it and they would get points for classifying the data. Yeah, and I get that. I, that I get. I thought I heard you say that it was automatically being transferred up based upon an activation or something. It used to be, but I, but I, okay. I don't know. All right. I don't All right. know. I'll figure it out. I, I gotta get it. I'll get into that code. I'll figure it out. It's, it's part of this whole process. All right. And, and yeah, I have a whole data pipeline that we want to kind of uh, get working so we can have a consistent, you know, data flow of data coming into the system and getting it classified and getting it into the models to constantly improve the model. And then Josh, you and I in the future will talk about how we can do that at a more local level by listening and um, kind of maybe rebuilding in an incremental manner locally. But we're not there yet, but, but we'll, we'll get to that conversation soon because that's, that's really, I think, where we're going to get our big bang for our buck is if we can take the base model and incrementally improve it based upon the user that's using it. But uh, I digress. Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, so whatever we, we do find out in this research we're doing um, this tomorrow morning is needs to be documented because I think there's still a lot of questions around, you know, where this data is going and, and where it's living and how, you know, all those things. We need to make sure that, you know, we, if we're going to answer those questions. Let's make sure they we don't have to answer them again. Yeah, stay answered. Yeah, absolutely, I'm big on that. That's why I'm documenting everything I'm doing on Wiki. And yeah, yeah, I want to get to the bottom of it. Um, we'll document. I'll document the process since that's knowledge that's valuable to this team, and we don't have it. Right. Uh, so Ken, just a quick uh, update. Your recollection is not wrong, but it's a it's a little bit off. The 
there is a bug report. It's precise 22. Uh, and it just says verify that wake word utterances are only collected for users that opt in. It's not because we thought we saw a problem. It's because there was a problem in a different system that we fixed. <clears throat> and out of abundance of caution, uh, Chris Vair thought that we should also check and make sure that um, there wasn't a problem in precise. Okay. Yeah, we, will... we encountered this issue a few months ago with the STT stuff. So um, I had to fix it up and announce it and all that good stuff. <laughs> So we've been through this rodeo once somewhat recently. Okay. Um, one other thing I wanted to bring up before we go is uh, an update on project rollover. Um, we've talked to their developer, um, at least what Derek did. He, he recycled or rebooted, or he power cycled his devices and now the audio works. Um, so after power cycling them several times and the audio not working. Um, so on the bright side, it does work now. And we that's good on the downside. The, the sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't bug is a very hard one to nail down. Um, well, it sounds like it's a timing issue in the bring up sequence now. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know if it's software or hardware um, okay. necessarily. I, I, I talked to OK about this a little bit um, in chat, and he gave me the very reassuring statement of, um, and also Linux audio is sometimes magic, especially when also used directly. That gave me a warm fuzzy right there. Um, so, yeah, I don't know <laughs> what to say about that, but um, if we really, if this is the only time, this is the only, the only case of this that I know of, um, if it's happening elsewhere, then something we need to look at because we don't want to be shipping devices that just pump out audio when they feel like it. Um, <laughs> so, um, well, yeah, uh, with our new system, we're going to be doing a lot more, um, taking a much more critical eye to like the boot up sequence and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's things that I'm sure we didn't even pay attention to, like the fact that the power supplies have to ramp up monotonically from zero to X volts, you know, in order to guarantee this chip works and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, using the, all the off shelf, off the shelf parts and, you know, uh, our, our, our uh, sort of, you know, hacked together system, um, you know, it's going to be a lot different with with the fully integrated board. Yeah. So just 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 to say, I'm not spending any more time on it now that it's working for him, and there seems to be just some weirdness going on there. I I could spend a bunch of time trying to figure it out, but unless it breaks again, I'm I'm not spending time on that right now. <laughs> okay. That's fair. So. All right. Um, does anybody else have anything before we wrap it up? No. Uh, Michael, did you still want to stay on and talk about Wi-Fi setup, or you want to do it another time? Sure, we can let everyone go, hang out, about talk about that. Sure. Um, I just dropped the endpoint that we're uploading Wavewood to, apparently. So. Uh, that might be a direction. So. Where, where did you find it? Uh, well, I took it from Jarvis because Jarvis does all sorts of weird stuff that has to see. <laughs> So this is this is this end training dot Mycroft dot AI persona tagger precise tagger tagger. Yeah, so the precise tagger is the is the one that Josh was talking about that. You know, people were tagging Haymarket, not Haymarket. Um, well, but the, yeah, but it says precise has moved when you click on it. We've moved precise tag yeah. to Microsoft under the tag got, tag. So it used to live as a separate thing, and then when we created the new backend, it got taken down. So yeah, the, I don't the think it's really like This is just where the tagging happens. Yeah, in yeah. other words, that's but there's that's gonna be where some this. other stuff. Because it's not in the tagger, I don't believe um, that endpoint isn't in the tagger, so it's got to be somewhere else. All right. Uh, yeah, I'll try to figure it out. I'll go through the code in the morning and figure out where 
the decisions made and I'll set a break point and trap it and make sure we're not doing anything we shouldn't be doing. And if we are, I will contact Michael right away. All right. Thank you, everybody. If you are riveted by Wi-Fi setup, in, um, then you can certainly <laughs> hang on. Um, if not, uh, we will talk to you all Thursday. All right. Talk to everybody on Thursday. All right. All right. See you guys.